Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, uh, thank you for joining us today for our uh, LIPS. Um, our speaker today is uh, Professor Giordana Ramalio, Associate Professor of Development Planning for Diversity at University College London. Uh, as usual, my name is Anna. I'm a PhD student here at the Urban Planning Program. I'll be moderating this section. Uh, a couple of uh, logistical uh, things to um, look at. Uh, so first of all, we are recording today's lecture. So if you don't wish to be recorded, please keep this in mind. After the presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, we will start our Q&A session around 2 to 15 p.m. So we'll have enough time for everyone's questions. Uh, I will give everyone opportunity to ask their question, but please limit yourself to like one question at a time, probably. Uh, and to ask questions, please just raise your hand and I will uh, give the other to you. Uh, and with that, I'm uh, invited to introduce our speaker for today. Their general, sorry. Uh, Zerdana Ramalio is an Associate Professor in Development Planning for Diversity and the Co-Director of the Master of Science Urban Development Planning Program at the Bartlett Development Planning Unit at University College London. Spanning the fields of urban geography, development studies, and feminist urban political ecology, the research explores the social spatial trajectories of urban development in the Philippines with a particular focus on disaster risk governance, resilience building, urban regeneration, and the intersectional dynamics of dispossession, displacement, and collective action that accompany them. Zerdana has 50, more than 15 years uh, of professional experience of working with non-government organizations in the UK, Canada, East Africa, Latin America, and the Philippines to support their operational and strategic interventions related to diversity and social inclusion, gender mainstreaming, HIV AIDS, housing and homelessness, youth offending and food security. Much of this work has focused on building institutional capacities to work with marginalized groups and to embed intersectionally attentive policies and approaches into their development practice. So please welcome Professor Amalio. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you all for welcoming me here today. I'm absolutely delighted to be here um, and to have an opportunity to share with you what is the essence of like the work that I've been doing for the past 10 years. Uh, so starting off in my PhD, like many of you today, um, and now is kind of I'm expanding that work. So as indicated by the title today, we're going to be speaking about uh, informality in the city um, and specifically looking at that in the context of Metro Cebu, uh, which is where I've been working since 2014. Um, and just to kind of contextualize this focus. So as I said, this is like both my current, my past research, which I did in my PhD, and it's showing my evolving research trajectories, right? Um, so what I'm hoping to do today, it's the first time I've presented it all as one, is to really showcase the links and like center my analysis of urban development in the city through a lens of informality and really trying to think through the ways in which uh, the treatment of informality is like, really central to urban development plans, but also to kind of what I call technologies of governance that relate to climate change, sustainability, and resilience building. So hopefully I make that case effectively today. Um, but in saying that, I'd really push you to kind of help me think beyond what I'm presenting you today, because I'm trying to expand, particularly the latter part of my presentation, I'm trying to think differently and outside common tropes of urban development. So if you have any ideas, we can talk about it during the questions or you know, afterwards when we when we meet for drinks. Um, right. So to very quickly situate my research, the Philippines is a lower middle income uh, country in Southeast Asia, made up of over 7,000 islands. Um, and in terms of urbanization, the majority of Filipinos still live in rural areas. OK, but, you know, bit by bit, it's, it's kind of becoming more urban. Um, and at the moment, it's estimated that 48% of the population in the Philippines is now living in cities. Um, and among urban residents, approximately 38% are estimated to be living in informal settlements. Okay. The Philippines is also one of the most disaster affected countries. Um, and it routinely experiences a whole host of different types of uh, climatic um, and environmental hazards, such as typhoons and earthquakes, but also landslides, floods, fires, and the kind of everyday hazards connected with uh, global warming. Um, 
And also I would argue with like poverty and infrastructural deficiencies connected to uh, urban poverty, right? Um, Metro Cebu is no exception to any of this. Um, the city is, is located in the central Visayas, which I've circled in red there. Uh, it's the capital of that region. The second largest metropolitan area in the Philippines um, has a population of just under 3 million people. And within that kind of agglomeration, approximately 41,000 households are considered to be informal settlements. Um, and 10,000 of those households are situated in areas that are uh, in like riverbanks or coastal areas that are um, very exposed to hydrometeorological hazards. Um, and you can see this here in a flood map. It's a dated flood map, um, but nonetheless, it kind of, the dark red area shows the areas of the metro region that are prone to flooding. Um, my, my research focused in, uh, my initial PhD research was focused in where those five kind of circles are. So I wasn't only looking at areas that were like, uh, evidently flood prone or, or at risk of flooding, but also areas that were prone to landslides, areas that were prone to uh, fires because they were high density in land settlements, so on. Um, and although at the time of my original research or my starting out research in 2014, uh, Cebu hadn't yet been affected by any major catastrophe, okay? Not since the 1990s. Um, and I say that any major catastrophe that, that was like recognized at an international scale, okay? So like Typhoon Haiyan, uh, one of the largest, I think it was the strongest storm at the time ever recorded, 2013, um, that affected the northern part of Cebu, but not the city itself. Um, and a few weeks before Typhoon Haiyan on this island right here, uh, oh, actually not that one, a bit further uh, kind of, yeah, east of uh, Cebu, there's an island called Bohol. They had a huge earthquake, okay, and that received a lot of international attention as well. So, um, the fact that risk is very much part of the everyday fabric of the city means that it's also been quite integral to the ways in which urban development plans are being conceptualized and like imagined and realized, right? Um, and the city's actually been recognized nationally and internationally as, as a leader of good practice and resilience and in disaster risk management. Now this, uh, these kind of claims, we could call them, were, were tested in December, 2021 when Typhoon Odette, uh, which was uh, a little bit less strong than Typhoon Haiyan, but caused arguably more damage, passed right through uh, the center of the city, um, resulting in over 200 deaths and a huge amount of damage to infrastructure. And it left people without uh, water and electricity for months. Um, so calls for creating a resilient, disaster-proof, and more recently, sustainable city. Um, I would argue are intimately connected with and, and driven by Cebu's worlding aspiration, okay? Um, and these worlding ambitions are, are evident in a number of different facets, right? And I'm gonna trace through some of these right now. So this is a picture of IT Park. This was built, I think, in like the 1990s, early 2000s. Um, and it's like, I I've called it a Singapore style, like IT Park, right? Like, tall buildings, wide pavements, uh, you know, very kind of luxury high-rise condominiums, nice restaurants, it's where the JP Morgans and the Price Waterhouse Coopers are all kind of based, a lot of finance organizations. That's, this is IT Park, okay? And this was like built I think, with the aspiration of drawing in foreign investment for business process outsourcing, right? You've also got these worlding aspirations featuring in, in um, these kind of residential or gated community projects, right? This is a, a billboard I took a photo of, and it's, uh, it's a gated community that aspires to or claims to contribute to the transformation of Cebu into a world-class lifestyle destination, right? You've also got the MAC-10 export, MAC export processing zone. It's opened in like the 80s and 90s. And again, it's an effort to draw in foreign investment. And then a more recent development here is the SMC side complex, right? And this is Super Mall. It opened in 2015. And at the time it was, it remains one of the largest in the world, okay? But as clearly depicted in this photograph here, which I took, um, uh, same mall next to one of the uh, neighborhoods that I was working in for my PhD, these kinds of urban imaginaries often fail to account for or are in some ways at odds with urban realities, right? Um, I think both worlding, both disaster risk management and worlding aspirations are very much premised around these kind of imaginaries of a desirable urban future that sit in opposition to an undesirable or dystopic alternative 
that's rooted often in present realities, right? Or, or at least perceived reality. And I would argue that these mutually reinforcing agendas, as I see them, of modernization and disaster risk management represent an emerging system of governance in Metro Cebu that is prompting a socio-spatial reorganization of the city along socioeconomic lines. Um, and very much as I'm seeing as my research kind of expands its realm of focus, I would argue that the targets of this kind of urban governance system are very much um, informal actors in space. Right. And I, I see this kind of narrative that seeks to kind of erase them from the city where possible. Um, so these processes are taking place through a discourse regime that relies on arbitrary moral categorizations of uh, informal spaces and, econ and economies that are premised around ideas of risk and vulnerability. Right. And these ideas are being mobilized to legitimize the displacement of these groups or the erasure of these spaces from the city while also, and this is really important, obscuring the role of the state, of the private sector, and of neoliberal urban development kind of trajectories more broadly in both producing and exacerbating conditions of risk and vulnerability, and we could argue of informality itself, right? And you can see this in this image here, right? Uh, this was taken from a brochure uh, from 2010, uh, a mega Cebu development project brochure, which was essentially a mega urbanization plan uh, that was spearheaded by prominent uh, business owners um, and endorsed by the city government. Um, it was very much a neoliberal approach to or, and market oriented approach to urban development that explicitly sought to encourage future investments and harness the city's full potential as a global economic hub. Right. Here's another image from the same brochure, which features rather dystopic images of informal settlements congested streets and an overflowing landfill, which are pitted against this utopic watercolor that prompts the reader to imagine a mega Cebu in 2050, right? Now these pictorial depictions of Cebu of today as a chaotic, polluted, overpopulated and inherently risky city very much seems to situate uh, the urban poor um, at the heart of many of these issues, right? Or at least as like emblematic of them. Um, and this here, I'm gonna draw on Asher Gertner's work. So what's happening here is this equation of slum related nuisances with slums themselves, right? Um, and within this, what, what we're seeing is this kind of uh, an insinuation of the urban poor's vulnerability come culpability in terms of flooding, coastline degradation, environmental pollution, all these things, right? And what I'm arguing is that these subjective notions of risk and resilience have become very deeply entangled in the epistemologies of modernism that are being propagated in Cebu, and that these are really operating as a technology of governance. And I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail shortly. So disaster risk management is, is a core feature of uh, Cebu's master plans for building a globally competitive, sustainable, and resilient city region, right? And one example of this is uh, the spatial reorganization of the city, or the proposed spatial reorganization of the city through uh, an urban cluster system, right? And this this is like, so it's, what they're trying to do is create like different zones for different types of uses and, and quite crucially uh, enforce them strictly. I've taken this from the document. Um, and the interest here, the reason that this is being kind of put forth is so that you have less hazardous urban spaces that are free from landslides and floods. We see this kind of mobilization of safety, of disaster risk, to legitimize this, these kind of new urban planning zones, right? Um, so within this, one of the key things I want to draw your attention to is there. There was a proposal to to change the actual city limits. Okay, so this is this is Cebu, um, and this kind of along here, not really a topic. This is island, right? It really affects urban development in Cebu because there's only so much area not only because it's an island, but because the topography doesn't lend itself to easy development, right? What they were proposing here is to redraw the city limits to exclude the hilly areas of the mountain tops, right? There's also a proposal to develop or create a green loop um, to promote um, kind of, a, they call it attractive urban functions, right? They failed to elaborate on what attractive or less attractive urban functions constitute, right? Now, these efforts to promote functional, safe, and environmentally friendly urban areas um, are very much being presented as desirable and beneficial for everyone, right? 
But the reality is, is that it's likely to have uh, quite damaging impacts on lower income populations, right? Um, particularly because many of those people are actually residing in the hillsides, uh, sometimes not even by choice. They're being relocated there from danger zones within the city to municipal uh, relocation areas in the hillsides, right? So, and the other thing to note is that if you fall outside the city limits, your right to uh, take part in elections, your access to public services will differ quite greatly, right? So there's some interesting political dynamics that are also going on here, right? Um, I think that this display really reflects um, efforts to mark Cebu as an exemplary center, right? And here I'm drawing on Kusno's work and theorizations to understand Southeast Asian urbanism in many ways as a spectacle of order and development, right? And this notion of like a spectacle, um, I think Asher Gertner also plays with that in his work on, on the world-class aesthetic, right? And he argues that this takes shape through the dissemination of a compelling vision of the future and the cultivation of a popular desire for such a future normatively presented around a clean, comfortable and nuisance-free imaginary, right? A spectacle that enables an aesthetic mode of governing or rule by aesthetic uh, that facilitates and legitimizes plans for world-class city making. Now, Ai Wong, in this fabulous book here that I would highly recommend to all if you haven't read it, um, she contends that neoliberal logics underpinning these mo modernist tropes and technologies of governance serve to recast problems as non-ideological and non-political issues that require technical solutions, right? And I'd argue that in the Philippines and, and in Cebu specifically, that these worlding ambitions are being bolstered and legitimized um, by the climate crisis, really, and disaster risks that like prevail in the area and by efforts to govern or adapt to climate change into these risks, right? And build more resilient cities. And here I find uh, the work of Kasia Paprocki. Um, she's based at the LSE and she's uh, recently published a book uh, tracing her research in Bangladesh, looking at like shrimp farming in um, areas of the, the Bengal uh, Bay, right? And she um, frames very similar dynamics taking shape in Bangladesh under the concept of anticipatory ruination, right? And she argues that anticipatory ruination facilitates dispossession through the production of alternative landscapes in response to what is seen as inevitable ruination due to climate change. And that this entails the erasure of other histories of ruination and discourses that highlight the politics of ongoing dynamics of ruination in the present and beyond climate change. So a lot of ruination going on there, but the crux of what she is saying is that by, by anticipating a future, a dystopic future and presenting climate change as something that is like, and the effects of climate change as something that is inevitable and inevitably bad, um, you're basically, you're obscuring the fact that, you know, this might be happening, but there are other ways for us to address this and that the outcomes aren't guaranteed, right? If we approach the problem slightly differently and the solutions differently, we could have different outcomes. That's the crux of what, what she's arguing here. So in Cebu, this anticip anticipatory ruination is very much material materializing through the clearance of informal settlements. Um, and specifically the clearance of informal settlements from waterways and coastlines, okay? Now, demolitions of this neighbor, nature have been ongoing for some time, and they're very much promoted as necessary to protect vulnerable communities from exposure to floods um, and other related hazards, while simultaneously and helpfully, they would say, removing the structures and individuals seen to be causing the floods, right? The houses that are blocking water and the garbage that comes from these houses, right? Um, now, in 2013, the Cebu city government uh, began a major program of flood management that was entitled the Reduction of Danger Zone Project, right? And this was led by a, a municipal body that I think rather aptly named um, itself the Prevention, Restoration, Order, Beautification, and Enhancement Office. So we've got a lot of different kind of values kind of coming into play in this naming of the office that's responsible for danger zone uh, reduction right, and flood management by informally, uh, by quite violently displacing and demolishing people's homes, right? Um, now this photograph here, taken uh, next to the Mahiga Creek. So this was one of the first areas in the city that was um, kind of targeted for this flood management program. Um, and 
over the course of my field work in 2016 and 2017, um, 357 of the 714 families that were living along the Mahiga Creek on the Mandawi city side. So there's lots of cities that make up the metro area. So these houses were uh, basically uh, forcefully demolished um, under this program, right? Um, and there were plans ongoing and since 2016 plans have continued uh, under this kind of flood management um, narrative and an objective, right? What I think is really interesting and important for us to think about is the fact that of the 3,912 informal, informal settler families that were identified and classed by the, the government department as living in a danger zone, right? They were only classed on this basis due to their proximity to waterways. Right? There was no discussion of other informal settlers that were living in areas that were prone to landslides, that were prone to, to fires, that were in heat traps. Um, and as I said, often connected with government relocation programs. So there's, there's a real focus on uh, hydro, hydrological risk um, and waterways specifically. And I think we can think about that critically when we think about the name of the operating body that's looking at beautification of the city and restoration of order, right? So I'll leave that with you. Um, I also want to now draw just a link to Maria Alvarez's work. So she's a colleague at the DPU. She's finishing her PhD right now. She's been tracing kind of flood management programs in Pasig, uh, Pasig City in Manila, right? And she also um, found very similar kind of flood specific danger zone designations and did some really interesting work for her master's where she actually traced the origins of the term danger zone not to disaster risk and climate related things, but actually to UDHA, which is a law that explicitly looks at kind of governing and managing informal settlements, right? And, and kind of delineates the eviction processes connected with them. So there's a very clear link between danger zone definitions, as she argues, and the objective of kind of informal settlement erasure or evictions, right? So my objective in kind of bringing your attention to all of this is not, it's not to criticize disaster risk management efforts in the city or the kind of very needed ambition of facilitating more collaborative urban planning that was like at the heart of the mega food development project, right? But what I'm trying to do here and what I think is important for all of us to reflect on is the socio-spatial implications of these mass infrastructure projects and approaches to kind of thinking through risk and resilience and sustainability um, that necessitate the often forced displacement of thousands of the city's most vulnerable residents, right? And also I wanna draw attention and we need to think about the kind of the moralistic and very stigmatizing undertones um, that inadvertently mark particular communities as the cause not only of their vulnerability, but of the city's susceptibility to flooding, right? And this packaging of disaster risk management and resilience through worlding narratives offers a validation of anti-slum rhetoric, right? And it very conveniently obscures the culpability of the state and private and commercial developers in the production of risk and of disasters, right? I'm gonna share with you a, a brief ethnographic vignette that I think speaks to these complex politics at play that are very conveniently being kind of pushed to the side, right? This is a photograph uh, taken from an informal settlement about 350 meters from the Mahika Creek, okay? So it's not, it's not on the waterway. Um, it houses just over, uh, at the time, it housed approximately 400 families, right? And these families, for the most part, had been living in this sitio. Uh, it's called Sitio Aroma. They'd been living there, um, you know, for for a long time, okay? Um, and I mean, like, like decades, okay? When the area, even around them, was predominantly wet, like wetlands, they grew water spinach, so it really didn't look like what it looks like today, okay? In the 1990s, uh, uh, a family who's an elite family in the Philippines known as the Aboites, um, they owned that lot and they decided that they wanted to start reclaiming the lot to prepare it for future development, right? And in 2015, uh, they entered into a joint agreement and a joint venture agreement with the Ayalas, which is another very prominent business family uh, in the Philippines. They own a lot of big malls. Uh, they own a lot. I'll just leave it there. Um, so they entered into a, a joint venture with them to construct several high-rise condominiums and commercial outlets on this lot, right? Now, through this process of reclaiming what was a wetland and filling it in, right? Um, Sitio Aroma no longer sat up here. They started to sit slightly lower down, right? 
and they became the receptacle of water and runoff from the surrounding area. Uh, and someone that I spoke to who lived in the area said to me, there are many big changes to our area since this development started. The water that's coming in from their development is now rushing towards our area. And since there's nowhere for the water to pass, it's staying in the area, like in our basketball courts. Previously, the water would flow out, but because of this development, it's much worse. And I feel that this really highlights the almost insidious ways in which like commercial enterprises are int they're really implicated in the production of risk and insecurity, right? Um, but that goes unmissed. And this is happening all over the city and not just in Cebu, not just in the Philippines. Like I think that happens everywhere, including London, probably in New York too, you know. Um, but we, we don't tend to think about that, right? Um, flooding is not the only type of disaster that affects residents. Um, the city has also experienced a uh, share, fair share of fires, um, some of them quite quite damaging, though luckily uh, no one died. So there were there was a major fire in 1994, another one in 2003, and a third one in 2010, right? Um, the last one destroyed all of the structures in the area. So the, the pictures that I've been showing you constitute a rebuilding after 2010. Now, in October 2015, when they entered into this joint venture agreement, what the developers did is they boxed off the entire settlement because to protect their land, right? So residents were like, okay, this is really worrying because we're affected by fires and you just basically boxed us in. So can we have fire exit? And they said, well, they, well, they first asked, can you take the walls down? And they said, no. And they were like, well, can we have a fire exit? And so after months and months of lobbying, uh, they said, okay, they turned one of these gates into a fire exit, which we should note is locked from behind, okay? The gatekeeper of that lock is located, you know, probably a kilometer away, half a kilometer away walking from the same entry. They've just left them the tiny entry to be able to kind of get in and out. 400 families, so approximately five people for, per family. You get a sense of what's going on, right? Um, I'm not sure how good of use that fire exit will be, right? Um, in the end, it didn't matter. This, uh, this settlement has since been uh, demolished. So people are now living in different areas. But the reason I'm telling you this story is because again, like the fire risk within this area, if you were to engage in discussions about it, it'd be because of densely located houses. It would be because people are using light materials to build their homes. The discussion wouldn't be about the fact that they've just literally boxed people in, right? The same goes with the flooding story I told you about before. And fires are often a precursor to eviction, right? So this is another kind of dynamic going on. Um, there's many stories of suspected arson, especially on privately owned land, such as in Sitio Roma, um, where landowners would use the exodus preceding a fire as an opportunity to fence off an area and prevent residents from re-entering, okay? And again, this puts residents in very kind of precarious circumstances uh, because they try to stay in an area to prevent that from happening so that they can maintain, you know, a claim to, to their land and, and rebuild. Now, this socio-spatial reorganization of the city along socioeconomic lines um, that's emerging on the back of worlding ambitions has been very much ramped up following the election of Mayor Mike Rama in June 2022. I should note as well that in 2010, Mike Rama was also the mayor, okay? So, like, he's kind of popped in and out. Um, we could talk about that later, but he was reelected in 2022. Um, and in his inaugural speech, he declared his vision to create a Singapore-like Cebu. Now, I wanna spend the last part of this presentation looking at the way, the incursion of the logics that I've kind of presented to you, right? And these kind of modes of governance, how they've been kind of creeping in and starting to target the informal economy, right? Um, and I'm going to do this by focusing on a rather contentious initiative uh, past couple of years um, to modernize Carbon Market, which is um, a public market in the city. Oh. It's the oldest and largest public market in the central Visayas, uh, arguably one of the oldest ones in the Philippines, because there's actually um, evidence that it's been operating as a key trading port prior to Spanish civilization in 1565, right? Um, if you remember my map, at the, at the very beginning, showing the central Visayas, it's such a strategic location. Like Cebu was supposed to be in many, and started off as the actual capital of the Philippines, right? Because it was a key trading port that connected all of the different islands. Um, it's also where the Spaniards first landed, right? Um, 
So I'm saying all this just to say Carbon matters. Like it's it's an important historic site. It's an important point of trade. Anything that's coming north or from the north moving south by boat, probably going to pass through Sydney. Okay. Um, so it, it gets its name. I think this is important to note. Carbon gets its name from, because it used to operate as like a, a coal, what would you call it? Like a coal factory. And you can see the, the old coal piles like standing right there. So the entire area was cut was covered in like in soot and dust, including many of the inhabitants and people that resided there, right? Um, the area has been largely stigmatized as like dirty, as like uh, unclean. And the residents of that area have been largely stigmatized according, right? Now, many people move to Carbon to engage in trade, right? Um, and happened to get covered in the soot that was there when it was operating. The moment, um, at least at the time that I started this particular piece of research um, in, in May of this year, there were approximately 4,000 ambulant vendors and about just under 2,000 stall holders that were operating from here. And that's just registered, right? Because there will be a whole bunch of people, uh, such as this uh, girl down here, who arguably are among kind of the most vulnerable and poorest, who rely on that market to trade everyday subsistence, right? So they'll collect shells from the shoreline, they'll trade shells for rice, and that's that's how they sustain themselves on a daily basis. And they, they're not accounted for in these figures. Now, in January of 2021, the city government entered into a joint venture agreement with Megawide Construction Company, right? And this is a firm, it should be noted, that has also been contracted to build and has built most of the city's big malls, okay? So the joint venture agreement set up plans for the commercialization and privatization of the carbon public market, right? And the aspiration was to transform it into a business center that consisted of like a wholesaler hub, a transportation hub, a lifestyle village with shops and restaurants, an airport check-in, uh, and they also had like a park with a chapel. So it was like covering several bases. I would ask you who this is serving, right? Something to, to hold in the back of your mind. But this was, this was the proposal. Um, it's very much been a project that's pitched as a heritage preservation and economic revitalization endeavor, right? The construction was due to be uh, kind of implemented over a five year period um, and in, it entailed relocating existing vendors and stall holders to this uh, multi-story complex here, right? I think it was a four story complex. Um, and on the right, you see, uh, Puso Village, right? So Puso Village um, was supposed to be the city's newest shopping and gastronomic destination, featuring homegrown like kind of favorites and well-loved food brands that showcase the heart and soul of Cebu. So I'm, I'm quoting here from a brochure. Um, and the construction of the village is in the shape of Puso, the hanging rice, right? This is a Philippine and Cebu specific uh, meal, delicacy, right? So you can see it's really playing on uh, identity of Zibuano, right? Um, and the church across the street, they constructed a huge replica of the Santo Nino, which is a saint that again is really central to Zibuano culture um, and to the Philippines more generally, right? Now, very similarly to the urban development narratives that I introduced you to in the context of disaster risk management, this project is also being presented as a solution to Carbon's problems in infrastructure, sanitation, and the environment. Um, and it, uh, they also state that it aims to revitalize Carbon's his history and heritage and economic relevance towards a first world Cebu, okay? So this is what, this is like the ambitions and aspirations behind this project. So the revitalization or redevelopment of the market is very clearly tied to worlding logics of the neoliberal city, right? And you can see this not just in the naming of megawide subsidiary, Cebu to World, who are supposed to be the kind of governing body that would be responsible for collecting fees um, from, from vendors and for maintaining the market, right? But you also see it in the aesthetic mode of governmentality that's being explicitly articulated in the kind of program promotions and also, um, in this kind of narrative here uh, from a representative of the Cebu City Market Authority. And he said, I'm just gonna pull a couple of things out. Um, you know, when the city is aiming for Singapore-like city, everything should be pleasing to the eyes, especially to the tourists. Everything should be nice and clean and orderly. So we see 
again, these narratives of restoration, order, beautification playing out. And the other thing that was really interesting is that this kind of very kind of Bukodian governmentality kind of narrative coming through in the sense that people should be disciplined in this Cebu like or Singapore like Cebu, right? Uh, people should be disciplined, cleaned, and orderly. All right. So, what happened? Well, taking advantage of lower numbers of vendors and football during the lockdowns that were imposed due to the pandemic, the um, project was ushered through without public consultation. An injunction, interestingly, was also simultaneously filed by the Cebu Port Authority, who actually owned the land on which the Puso village was being built. Now, you'd think that you would maybe check with the owners of the land before you went and build these things, right? But they didn't. Um, the Port Authority said we had loaned the land to the city government, uh, and so it was not, it's not like lawful for them to engage in, in a private development joint venture agreement without consulting us or involving us in the process. So that, that injunction has been upheld uh, as of recently. This is all happening like imminently as we speak. So that, that there was a court hearing a few weeks ago. So that's been upheld, uh, which means that the, the Puso village that you saw constructed there has been constructed, but can't be used. Okay. Um, so what that means is that you had this whole group of investors who would like, they were supposed to, they'd invest money in this. They were supposed to be operating in in Puso Village, they couldn't do that anymore. So they're really upset. They're kind of banging on the doors of Megawatt and, C and the city government. So the city government to like calm them down, they're like, okay, fine. We're gonna move you here to this other area, which is uh, Freedom Park and Warwick Barracks, where there were high concentrations of, of food vendors. Um, that was where that, in, that, that big four-story building was supposed to be built, right? Instead of having all these kind of private entities that were in Puso Village, got uh, moved and they were moved uh, in order to make space for them. Basically, people who were residing in Warwick Barracks and Freedom Park uh, were told with very little no notice that they had to dismantle their stalls. Um, we're talking people that have been there for generations. Okay, many people also living, living at these stalls so that they can operate for as many hours of the day as possible, literally almost overnight, having their livelihoods and homes demolished, right? Some people were able to push back uh, but the majority were forcibly relocated to an interim building. I just, I'm showing you this. This is basically kind of one market here. It also spans some of the, the side of the sides, um, an interim building, and then you have the interim building currently. So we're talking a huge area, right? This just shows some of the destruction caused in kind of as physical evidence. Um, this is where people were moved to, right? Um, the impact on vendors has been huge, okay? Uh, if you remember the amounts of vendors that I'm speaking about. So what we have is a situation where people have been sent to kind of second, third floors of, of this building um, and they've lost their customers. Their income's been hugely affected because there was no consultation or like, this wasn't, it was planned by someone, but it wasn't done it, 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 the way that it was approached, like, just made it so difficult. Like, they couldn't tell their returning customers where to find them, right? Um, and I think some of these kinds of narratives here, which I'm not going to read out, but they just speak to the multiple types of impacts, right? Not just, like, economic, but also effective, right? A huge amount of stress. Um, and you can see here, like, that's the lot that the size of a lot that people are given. So didn't matter if you had over the years built up a huge area for selling your goods, um, which you will have purchased. It's not like they just squatted it, right? So there was there's an economic trade that goes on in these spaces. You're not compensated for that. You're given a, a short kind of area um, in which to operate from on the third floor of a building that nobody's going to go to, right? So many of them stay empty. Um, an, a major concern, another major concern about this redevelopment project, um, apart from the location that they now find themselves in, comes down to the costs associated with trading, right? So the proposal, um, which again is being negotiated and, and fought back against, but the proposal is that, that if this goes ahead, instead of paying 20 pesos for bu per bucket, right? So let's say like 50 cents for argument's sake, instead of paying 50 cents per bucket uh, of goods that you're bringing into the market, you're now gonna have to pay 240 to 270 pesos, right? And that amount is not going to be collected by the city government. It's going to be collected 
by Cebu to world, by a private entity, okay? Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of different layers to this, but what, what is essentially here is the privatization. What's happening is the privatization of a public market and a public good, right? Um, and this is a quote from a friend, uh, journalist and activist who's been working with the Carbon vendors and trying to raise awareness in the city about what's going on. And he said, when he spoke to the city, he said, by your own admission, Carbon market is overcrowded. So how come you're reducing its size? How come instead of five buildings, you're now only going to build two and you compensate for this by having like a third floor, but who goes to the third floor, right? So even in malls in the Philippines, like when you go to the third floor, they're, they're almost empty, right? Nobody goes, nobody goes up there, right? Um, and he's making links to these aspirations of turning Carbon into a world-class mall, right? So on the back of everything that happened with the Port Authority, the plans that I showed you originally have been scaled back considerably. What you have now is like a, a one level uh, area in Freedom Park where the vendors from Puso Village are now located. Uh, you have the interim building. I mean, everything has been scaled back so drastically. The question is like, where are people going to go, right? Um, so I think what a lot of this, so kind of, I'm gonna start to, to draw this to, to a bit of a close here. I think what we see is really a politics of bossism playing out. We see this in different ways. And bossism is a term that was coined by John Seidel. And he's referring to the prevalence of local power brokers who achieve sustained monopolistic control within given territorial jurisdictions and use their discretionary powers over zoning ordinances, construction contracts, and police forces to oil their political machines, right? And to serve as gatekeepers to foreign investors and Manila-based investors, and also I would argue Cebuano investors, right? So you see this, this politics of bosses and really playing out. Um, when we think about formality and informality, it's helpful to think about this political economy that is very evidently taking shape, right? There's another really critical side to the story that I want to, to kind of finish with, um, and that is how people are responding to and resisting these modes of governance, right? Um, so the market vendors actually first heard about these proposed changes via Facebook. Um, and when they started to see that there were plans to redevelop the market, uh, a few of them started doing their own research. So they, they started kind of scratching beneath the surface, checking like newspapers and so on. Um, and the more that they found out about the proposed public-private partnership, um, they realized like, for example, the, the costs for Baniera, the, the differences that were gonna, and the real implications, what this would mean for vendors. They went to the streets, they took to the streets, they had megaphones and they started telling people what was going to happen, right? And this marked the birth of what is now the Carbon Hanong Alliancia. So Hanong means like people. So it's like the, the alliance of people from Carbon, right? And this is a network of vendors who are actively lobbying to stop the privatization of the market, right? Now, these individuals don't identify as activists, okay? And very importantly, they told me they are not against modernization, okay? They would like to see investment into the market, obviously, you know? But what they're against is the approach that's taken place and the privatization, the inherent privatization of what is a public good, a public service, a public space. Um, so it's a huge part of their, their contention, right? So in terms of those strategies, yes, they take to the streets and they're kind of just educating people about what's happening and trying to mobilize a collective resistance of like critical, critical, uh, thinkers who are pushing back and asking critical questions, right? Um, they've also actually challenged, they, they've gone into a legal hearing to challenge uh, the proposed amendments to the market code um, and the ways in which the state has unlawfully approached the demolition uh, of, of market vendors to date. Um, and the whole, the premise of the joint venture agreement, they argue is unlawful because of how it was approached. Um, I would also argue that ambulant vendors, just by staying put, so by leaving their stalls empty and by actually being on the streets are actually resisting. Um, yeah, they're resisting. They're almost, it's a way of like claiming, making themselves build, like visible and claiming their rights to the city, their rights to livelihood and the rights of the public market as, as an entity in, it, in and of itself. Now shifting back to thinking about disaster risk management, um, informal settlers are also pushing back. And one of the main ways that they're doing this is um, 
through the formation of homeowner associations, which are essentially state mandated institutions that um, serve as like a formally recognized institutional platform through which informal settlers are able to negotiate with the state, whether that's for like improved services, for access to resources to support disaster risk management, or um, you know, to negotiate relocation packages and support if they do need to be evicted, right? Um, I think in coming together and sort of registering formally as a homeowner association, these settlers are making themselves vi visible to the state in the same way that Cadbohano is making themselves visible as like a political group. Um, and I think in the context of homeowner associations and the Cadbohano Alliancia, what we see is this like really important sites through which knowledge is being generated. You see uh, social capital being mobilized. Um, and I think this is like, when we think about questions of resilience and adaptive capacities, this is arguably hubs where, where this is taking, taking place, right? It's really vital sites of urban resilience. So to conclude, um, I think what I would say is that worlding aspirations and aesthetics and these like claims or links to resilience, to sustainability, to heritage preservation. I maybe should have put can function, but certainly in Cebu's context, I would argue are functioning to legitimize the dispossession and displacement of urban poor people and specifically informal spaces and economies from the city. Um, the privatization of public space through narratives of collective good also needs to be thought of really critically, right? We need to think about like who's who's benefiting from this and what actually happens when you, what happens to the social contract when you privatize a public good such as a market, right? Um, and also what are the underlying causes of, in the case of the market of informality, of uncleanliness, of garbage buildup? Is it is it the people selling there themselves or is are there other things at play like the absence of infrastructure, the lack of like, uh, you know, a cohesive approach to waste management governed by local government that's taking shape in these spaces. And actually, you know, are we addressing structural causes through privatization or are we obscuring them? And lastly, I think the work of homeowner associations, the work of the vendors themselves really speaks to the fact that alternatives are possible. Okay, so thinking back to Cassia Aproki's work, like, and I'd encourage you to read her book if, if you haven't, um, because actually there, there's another way, right? If you, if you engage with the people that are actually affected more than anyone by these issues of climate change, by issues of waste management, by issues of urban development and gentrification, right? If you speak to people that live in these neighborhoods and are routinely affected by these things, they have ideas for how you can fix them. They have ideas for where to target investments. In the case of Carbon Market, this group of vendors worked with lawyers, urban planners, architects, designers, they have their own plan for the market. At the moment, the city is not engaging with them on this, but their plan costs several hundred million pesos less than the plan that the government is putting through, right? And it's a well thought through plan, it engages with all the necessary legal spaces, right? So alternatives exist. The question is like, how can we give more space for alternatives to come through? And I think you're all, I believe, PhD students. Many of you will come from practice. Like, I think something to leave us with is like to think about what's our role as academics, as practitioners, in whatever spaces we come from. How can we kind of give more space to creating and opening up alternative visions for these urban people? I will stop there. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't speak to you. Thank you. Talk. Uh, we're now ready to go for the questions.